Hello. All right, I can hear the wall. Actually, the, the eru this is the first time in about 30 years that Kilauea has stopped erupting, so. <laughs> All right, so my talk is about offline peer-to-peer -peer mapping and some work that I've been doing uh, for, I don't know, four years now. Geez, it's been a long time. Uh, so my slides are online if you want to check them out later. I've got a lot of links at the end, so uh, this is me. Uh, I'm a member of bits.coop. We do consulting work as a worker-owned cooperative. And I've been working with this nonprofit NGO, uh, Digital Democracy, since 2015 or so, building these peer-to-peer -peer mapping tools used by indigenous communities. So the groups that I'm going to be focusing on are based out of uh, Guyana and Ecuador uh, with Alianza Cebo in the Ecuador region of the Amazon and also into Peru a little bit. Uh, here's a map of that, just to give you some idea. Um, so I also got the opportunity to travel to Guyana to meet some of the environmental monitoring uh, team there and the mapping team. So I'm going to start with some of the issues facing uh, the the Wapachan communities, uh, nations in Guyana, in the South Rupununi, it's near Brazil. So there's a huge problem right there, uh, right now, with gold mining, both illegal and also uh, through mining concessions. So the environmental monitoring team that we've been working with has reported over 250 um, observations of illegal activity or harmful activity, uh, the mercury, gets into the water supplies, uh, damage to cultural sites, sacred sites, uh, deforestation. There's a lot of problems with this kind of extractive industry. And uh, at, here at the end, over 50% of those have been caused by this mining activity. And the Wapachan right now are working, uh, they're in talks with the government of Guyana to push back against this uh, Canadian gold mining company that wants to come in and mine Maruti Mountain, which is a, a site of considerable cultural significance. Um, so here's, uh, here's a quote from Ron James, the, um, the sort of person who does a lot of the mapping work with ArcGIS and like lugs a, a bunch of maps when he goes, when he takes the plane ride from uh, Georgetown to Lethem and uh, you know, also is doing a lot of the work with plotters, and that's difficult on generator power. Uh, and I'm just going to read this quote really fast, because I think it's important to quote directly from our partners that we work with. So, by mapping the mining pollution sources, we now understand how it affects wider river systems and water supplies that are essential to our villages for fishing, bathing, and drinking. Uh, we're bringing this monitoring information to the attention of the environmental and mining authorities, yet the problem continues unabated. And to give you some more idea of uh, what we're talking about here, so this is a map of the, the whole map pretty much is the traditional territorial extent of the Wapachan. And the blue areas are formal titles that have been granted by the government. And down there in pink, uh, are the, mining, the existing mining concessions that they've had to deal with. And uh, Maruti Mountain, where this new bout of gold mining that they're organizing to resist, is in an area that uh, the, one of the communities in the middle, Aishalton, is uh, requested a territorial extension for it. And it's, you know, it's, it's a complicated, difficult political problem. Uh, but importantly, um, this work has been going on for a while, since 2000, this particular mapping effort. Um, so it's not, I think it's important for technologists like me who want to work on these projects that um, you know, coming when presence is requested for technical assistance and kind of just listening and understanding and working with existing uh, political projects. So the other, um, another group that uh, digital democracy has been partnered with is uh, Alianza Cebo. This is a group that operates um, uh, out of Ecuador. And the main problem for the Warani and also the Kofan um, and other groups in the area is oil, uh, is oil drilling. And so 
There's been oil drilling since about the 60s, and it causes all kinds of problems, as you can imagine, um, like damage to ecosystems, deforestation. And the new concessions that are going in are for Block 22, and this is something that the Warani and other communities in Alianza Cebo and also neighboring areas are trying very hard to resist. Um, and their message is quite clear. Uh, our message for the oil companies, our land is not for sale. And so uh, here is a map that they've put together, and I'm going to start to talk about how this map was put together. So this map is really cool. Uh, this is a map of Warani traditional territory. Uh, and here's a village. This is an interactive map that the Warani have chosen to publish to share with the world. Hopefully to share with you. You can see that um, there's a lot going on in this map. We've got, uh, we've got the locations of important plants for making thatch roof. Uh, we've got tapir tracks, uh, jaguar tracks, important medicinal plants here with the tree with the plus. Uh, where snakes sometimes occur, um, the locations of villages. This one is really cool. You can't see it too well, but that's a cell phone icon. And so this is a location where you can pick up a cell phone signal. Maybe you have to hold it in the air, or maybe <laughs> you, know, you have to stand on top of a car <laughs> to get it, but you can get it, and that's really important um, because if someone in the community gets a snake bite and they don't have any anti-venom, then they can call for a helicopter to come in and hopefully save someone's life. So this map is, um, there's a link to it in the, in the notes. It's, you can see this is quite full of resources. Um, but if you look on a government map, this area is empty. They don't put things like you know, where these important resources are on their maps. And this gives uh, the Warani and other groups an important bargaining tool uh, for talks with the government to show, hey, we are using this land for these important purposes, and we don't want this extractive industry to come in and, you know, and harm us. So, uh, for, in terms of what technology is needed, you know, technology in itself is only a tool for informing these other processes, like um, local decision making, like the community needs to be well informed to have uh, meetings, like not only with external parties, like governments, but also for just, you know, having good information about your territory. Uh, part of that is gathering evidence, like with smartphones, looking at the locations of oil spills and things like that, um, or mining, like mercury equipment. Uh, and also preserving traditional knowledge is, is an important component of this, especially with uh, the older generation um, you know, passing on and the younger generation, in many cases, unfortunately, moving to the cities without, without learning these things. So technology tools are useful for kind of preserving that knowledge before it might be lost. So uh, there's two main components for these technology tools. There's the mapping components and then the environmental monitoring components. So for the mapping tools, uh, loading satellite imagery so that uh, people can you know, trace out rivers and paths and the locations of villages is pretty important. Um, and like I said, uh, paper maps are also a big important component of this, so any maps that are made, uh, it's good to have a hard copy because hard, hard copies work very well offline in these, in these sorts of environments. Um, and you can pass them out to families in the villages. And you can also, uh, you know, document the locations of important traditional medicines or important cultural, um, cultural sites, That's, that sort of thing. So in, f in terms of environmental monitoring, uh, that might consist of taking photos or taking video, uh, gathering GPS coordinates with GPS, proper GPS devices, not smartphones because the sensors aren't, aren't quite as good, and uh, also taking like quick notes, either sometimes via text, but often voice is, is a bit easier um, when you're out doing field work. And um, uh, some of the communities are also using drones to do aerial surveys. A big problem with this work, uh, which is sort of what, what I and what Digital Democracy has been working on, is kind of shoring up the shortcomings with tools that are broadly available. So 
tool, uh, professional GIS tools are quite difficult to learn. The learning curve is very steep. Uh, they're generally not collaborative, so you, you know you can't involve a whole community or you can't involve neighboring communities in with a big group mapping project. And very often there are poor online assumptions. Like some of the drone, um, the drone imaging tools require an internet uplink for the purposes of, uh, you know, having a licensing tracker thingy, and it just doesn't really work very well if you've got a really spotty cell signal or if you have a satellite internet that has an aggressive cap. So there's also uh, power sources are a big challenge. Um, so most of the villages have solar panels, and like many of uh, family homes have small solar panels, or people often like use their motorbike or they use their truck to power like cell phones usually, sometimes small laptops. Uh, internet access is difficult. It's quite expensive. Uh, most of the villages, like in Guyana, have a village office that has a satellite uplink, but they're, they, uh, after you go, go over a certain point, like 20 gigabytes, it just stops working completely. So, you know, if there's a new Android update available and all of the phones individually download the exact same data, maybe like 20 times, then you've spent your whole cap for the month. So it's it's quite challenging working with those sorts of constraints. And also, the devices themselves have to be quite durable. Um, you might drop your phone in a river, or ants are a huge problem. We have this problem on the Big Island, too. Ants love electronics. They love to like get in there and lay a bunch of eggs, and I've had SDR card full of ants. <laughs> um, this happens quite often. Uh, so. These, these tools have to work offline, they have to be able to collect important information, and they have to be easy to learn, and that also means that they have to be easy to teach. So these communities, ideally, should be teaching each other. They shouldn't have to rely on these external parties um, to kind of come in, swoop in, and, and do things. That, that's not a very good way to set up this, um, this sort of a project, which is anti-colonial in nature, so you really don't want to be reproducing that kind of dynamic as much as possible. And it's important, too, that the map presets are based on local knowledge. So all of the maps in the Warani map that I just showed you were designed by the local community on paper, and then uh, a designer came in and made SVG versions of those. So here's a great quote from Tessa, who's the um, monitoring coordinator in Guyana for the SEPTA. Uh, technology changes every day, and I'd like to learn more about developing software and writing commands, because right now we are dependent on people coming from the outside to do this for us. Um, it's kind of an important power dimension to be aware of, that like, we technologists have these skills that, um, that put us in a position of privilege and power, and it's important to point at that and think about how to remedy it. And Tessa is great, and she's already running Linux and, and learning programming. So, uh, Another important consideration with this is that the data be belongs to communities. It's not this sort of, uh, we kind of have this idea of open data that can be quite problematic if you know, putting a sacred site on a map means that a bunch of vandals will show up, which happens. Then, uh, or, you know, if you're pointing, if you're including the locations where gold can be found, you certainly don't want to have a gold rush coming onto indigenous territory and causing all kinds of problems. So it's important that the communities decide how their data is shared. So as far as data transfer goes for these projects, uh, there's of course the internet, but it has caps uh, with satellite service or sometimes cell phone service, and sometimes the cell phone service is using the satellite network. Or uh, people might drive into like the next big town, like into Lethem or into uh, a town that's on the road system in Ecuador. Uh, USB drives are a fantastic way to transfer data in these environments. Um, and all, our, our database, our peer-to-peer -peer database tools work really well with USB drives. We might have a local offline router or Bluetooth or et cetera. ADB is also a fantastic tool for uh, communicating with an Android smartphone. You can copy files and you can do a lot of, uh, you can run Unix commands on the phone. So we've been using that a lot to install um, to install the software onto the devices. Okay, so why, given all of that background context, why does peer-to-peer, P2P, make sense for this kind of a problem space? 
Well, importantly, there's no uh, critical or privileged devices. So nothing that can't get lost in a river or can't get covered in ants, you know. Uh, you have many devices making writes offline, and everybody, every device has a backup. And the devices can talk to each other in this kind of a network called the gossip network in order to uh, transfer information. So you have implicit backups, and it's, it's pretty great. So the tool uh, that I've been working partly on, mostly in the database layer, is called Mapeo. Uh, it's for desktop and mobile. It uses ID Editor, which is a tool for OpenStreetMap. And so the data model for OpenStreetMap is used in ID Editor. And we have some layers at OSMP to PDB that use peer-to-peer -peer techniques. So just to give you a quick idea of what that looks like, here's a, just a quick screenshot of the, the tool. Um, to make an offline peer-to-peer -peer network, you can use this thing called a Kappa architecture. That's where you have an append-only log. Uh, Tools like Git have this sort of structure internally also. And you build materialized views on top of that log, things that might be like a key value store or a spatial index for mapping data. Uh, we use the OpenStreetMap model because a lot of the tools are based on that. So it has nodes, nodes ways, and relations. And here's some examples of that. Uh, we do have to kind of change this model a little bit. So for example, IDs. You can't monotonically increase IDs because uh, two devices might try to create the same ID. So what you can do is generate very long, ran cryptographically random IDs instead for that. Uh, versions also have a similar problem. So you can use the hash of the previous document, or you can use uh, the location in a, in a vector clock, like the sequence number in your version entries. And with a few small changes like this, uh, you can build these kind of networks. So OSM P2P was our first iteration. It uses an append only log based on this tool, NPM module called Hyperlog. And we have some materialized views for a KV store, uh, a join model that kind of lets you deal with more normalized data like OSM data is, and a spatial index, the KDB tree. Um, the thing is, with peer-to-peer, -peer, with this kind of gossip network, uh, write performance is actually very important because every time that two devices sync up, you have to write all of the records in. And we got to the point where, with one of the prototypes, it was taking 15 minutes to sync a, a database with about a quarter million records on it. And so for the, the new version, uh, batch write performance has been really important. And here's uh, some of the components in the new version. Uh, other future applications include building um, unordered materialized views, so things that work kind of out of order because that's useful if you need to use uh, encryption to kind of have a, a sharing model that where you might want to also have remote backups and not necessarily share that information with the, the whole public. So here in the, in the slide notes, I'm going to skip over this real quick, but uh, have just a quick example of like how you can build this kind of a key value materialized view if you're interested. And um, it's important to think of it in terms of, like you might think about a Git repo where you can have forks of the data and then also tools for merging the, the content back into place. Uh, spatial index are a big part of this work because they have to work really fast, they have to work really well offline. Um, everything that we've done is built on uh, the DAT project tools like Hypercore and uh, random access storage modules. And as far as uh, future work goes, uh, the sparse replication is also a big element of this. Because as these databases grow, uh, then you can't store the entire database on a single device. So uh, as far as future work goes, uh, we've also recently got a grant for this other related project called Peer Maps. And this is um, uh, Mapeo, the tool, also got a, a 50K grant from Samsung. So get to work on this more uh, full time. And as far as the database go, uh, as far as the project goes, this is more of a tool for building uh, something that can take in all of the Planet OSM, the OpenStreetMap data, and kind of distribute it over these peer-to-peer -peer networks in a way that's also going to benefit uh, the the mapping work with Mapeo, um, because a lot of the core components are the same. So. And this is just a great quote I wanted to end on. This is from uh, Opi, our mapping coordinator. I just want to read it really fast. Uh, we, ra we warani, like Mapeo, 
because it is an open program and it's not too difficult to learn. It's been really helpful to us to allow us to manage our own mapping program and for the first time people in all the villages including the local technicians but also even the elders who don't speak Spanish or know how to read have been able to understand it. It is also the first program we've ever seen where we can use our own icons for things and for it to be in our own language rather than in English or Spanish. With Mapeo we have for the first time a tool that we can use to make our own maps and we can build a strong team of people who can train others to map. The mapping project has united many villages to defend and manage their lands together and it is a process which is leaving a legacy for the future, both the maps and the skills that our people can use to fight for our livelihoods and our rights. And I have a bunch of links if you're interested in, in more of the projects and also in um, some of the activism here locally on Hawaii that's indigenous-led. So, thank you very much.